Hi, these are edited versions of the lectures that I taught synchronously over Zoom. I hope you find them useful. We are ready um, to start lecture 13, which is going to be an inference in moment inequality models. And this lecture is sort of like going to be split in two. So this is going to be part one. Next Tuesday, we're going to have part two. And this lecture is going to be about these two papers that I'm listing here, uh, which were part of the same session at the World Congress in 2015 on the topic. And the first one, which is the one that I'm actually going to cover, um, is the one that I wrote with the Sim Sheik, which is mostly about theory. And the second one, as I said, which was part of the same session, was intended to be more about applications, and that's what they do. I think the combination of the two pap papers gives you a, a good sense of, you know, uh, what's the theory and the applications behind this. Um, having said this, by now there are like some um, other good, um, you know, um, I want to say surveys of the literature, one by Francesca Molinari, another one by Ely Tamer. They all like try to go for different things. Um, and most often they're quite long. Um, so, but you know, if, if um, right now you're somebody getting into this literature, it's not a bad idea to start by with one of these surveys as opposed to the papers. The papers, you know, are all good. The main problem of this literature, that happens in a lot of other literatures, but here's particularly noticeable is the notation. It's like different papers introduce and, and explain things using different notation. And it's even sometimes unclear about how you connect one idea with the other one. And that's exactly what we try to do with Asim in this paper was to give a comprehensive framework to explain all these papers. And that's what I'm gonna do um, in these two lectures, okay? So, um, in a way, this class is going to fit nicely into the issues of uniformity that we discussed before, because uniformity was a prominent problem in this literature in a non-trivial way. So before we talk about uniformity issues with like testing the mean, the t-test, and we talk about subsampling and the bootstrap along the way, and today we're going to talk about inference in moment inequality models. And you're going to see that the uniformity problems are going to show up. Bootstrap is just going to show up and it's going to fail. And subsampling is going to be to the, come to the rescue and it's just going to provide answers. But then people are going to just, you know, fix the bootstrap and then we're going to have something else. <coughs> so the idea is that, you know, in this literature, we're going to sort of like put together all the pieces that we describe up until, you know, this point in a way. So motivation, um, partially identified models is a situation where the parameter of interest is not uniquely determined by the distribution of the observed data. Okay. Being at Northwestern, I know that you guys have been exposed to this concept earlier, uh, in other courses, but here's sort of like a brief description, right? Instead, um, we say that the parameter is limited to a set. Okay. That is a function of the distribution of the observed data that is called the identified set. And, you know, all this literature was largely due to the work that Chuck um, made a long time ago. Now it is popular. May, there are many, many applications in different fields of models that are partially identified. Um, now, there's a literature in particular, a lot of the work even that Chuck did early on was about characterizing the identified set. It's like, okay, we know that in, in models where uh, certain assumptions are not assumed or where you want to be flexible over, about certain structure, that the model is no point identifying, it's partially identifying. One natural question is, how does the identify set look like? Okay, and a lot of these papers are about characterizing the identify set. Also answering questions about whether the identify set is called sharp, meaning that it exhausts all the information that you have in the model, or if it's more what is called an outer set, which is perhaps larger than what you need. And these are papers and topics that fall into identification per se, and then don't discuss much about how to do inference on these sets later on, 
what we're going to talk today mostly is the topic of inference, which is the literature that I worked on. And that as opposed to this um, earlier work where the, the idea is to characterize, you know, identify sets, takes the uh, description of the identify set as given. And in particular, okay, is going to consider problems where you can describe the identify set as a set of moment inequalities which as we're gonna see is just a particular case of partial identification, but is like well-developed and includes a lot of uh, examples. And so um, then, you know, as I said early on, it wasn't so clear how to do uh, inference in these models, but now this is well understood, although there are still, you know, areas of practical importance that are to be, um, need to be addressed, you know, one of them, uh, probably being computational aspects that are uh, behind all this machinery. And we're going to see that as the model becomes more sophisticated, you have more moments or more covariates or more parameters. Um, you know, conceptually, it's very easy to describe how you should do inference, but taking that to practice could be um, challenging. I'm going to start with two simple examples. And I know that you've seen probably one of them or both of them. I just want to get started with the notation so that we're all on the same page. I'm going to start with missing data example that I'm sure Chuck talked about, okay? Is a situation where you have data X, Z, I, I, D with support X is just in between zero and one, doesn't matter, but it's just uh, bounded. And then Z here is binary. And the main thing is that X is observed only if Z is equal to one, when Z is equal to zero, say somebody did not respond to question, you have a missing observation for x. The parameter of interest in this case, just simple, is the mean of x, which we're going to call theta. And then by the law of its expectations, this is pi, which is the probability that z is equal to 1, times mu 1, which is the expected value of x condition on z equals to 1, plus 1 minus pi times mu 0, which is the expected value of x, given that z is equal to 0. And so here, um, what we have is that if we do a plot, and here we put the object that we want, which is theta, and here we plot the object that we don't know anything about, which is mu zero, right? So remember, like mu zero here is going to be the expected value of x, given z is equal to zero. And when people say don't respond, we have missing observations. We have no idea what that mean um, could be. So by this relationship that we have over here at the top, um, we see that this relationship between what we don't know and what we want, in this case, is linear and it's simple. If mu zero is zero, then theta is just going to be pi times mu one. And if mu zero, you take it all the way to one, okay, uh, the theta is going to be pi mu one plus one minus pi. And then for any other intermediate value of mu zero, theta is going to take values over here. So when you look at the identification region for the parameter that we care about is provided by these two inequalities, which gives us this line in this part of the picture over here. And that's what we're going to call um, theta naught, capital theta naught. And it's just all the theta such that you're above this and below that, which is here in this picture, this line over here. And presumably if you saw like, you know, this example with in 48-1 to say something or in some other 41 sequence, then you see that this is typical, the, typically the representation of the identified set and missing data. However, the point here is that you can write this as a set of moment inequalities. And, you know, if you just take this piece and then the other piece, and then you put it in two and write it as moments, then you can see that you essentially can say theta or this identify set is a set of all thetas that satisfy these two moment inequalities. The first moment is the expected value of theta minus xz is greater than or equal to zero. And the second moment is one minus z plus xz minus theta greater than or equal to zero. So the second moment is this upper bound. The first moment is the lower bound. And so the idea that we're gonna exploit today is that we want to understand how to do inference in models that look like this so that we can apply the machinery without thinking about 
you know, um, each moment in a case by case, or sorry, each, each example in a case by case basis where we'll just do inference exploiting, you know, the structure of this, which, you know, sometimes could be harder to plot or anything. But the alternative approach will be just to try to write the set as a set of moment inequalities and work with this machinery. Okay. Is this example very clear? So we're going to use some initial notation that I'm not going to use later on uh, part of it, but I want to include it so that we understand what we're talking about. I'm going to say the data that we're going to observe is X has some distribution P in some family of distributions, ball P. Ball P is going to be indexed by a parameter gamma, and gamma is possibly infinite dimensional. The identify set for gamma is going to be gamma naught P, which is going to be all the gammas such that the model gives us the, the observed distribution of the data, P. Typically, we'll not, don't care about gamma. We just care about some feature of gamma that I'm going to call theta. And theta is what we care about. And the identify set for theta, well, it's just the projection. It's just going to be all the theta gammas, okay, such that gamma belongs to the identify set. So once you have this set, then take any gamma in the identify set and take the, uh, the thetas associated with that. That's the set. This is all conceptual. We're not doing anything. It's just definitional. Um, as an example, I want you to think about the linear model, which we all know very well. Y is equal to theta prime X plus epsilon. And then we're going to do P gamma. It's just going to be specified by theta, of course, and the di joint distribution of X and epsilon. Okay. So gamma is restricted typically. For example, we assume that the expected value of epsilon u is zero and that the expected value of x, x prime is invertible. We have these assumptions if we go back to 480, but in reality, most often, we just don't care about the distribution of epsilon condition on x or you know, the joint distribution of epsilon x. What we care about is the parameter over here in the linear part, okay? So in this case, theta, is um, identify um, in, and, and that's where, um, what we do, okay? Which is in, in, in this type of like, my point is like in, in the linear model, quite rarely we describe whether the distribution of U condition on X and so on are identified. We just care about a particular feature of the uh, parameters of the model. And it also illustrates how gamma could include infinite dimensional components. Like here in this case, the joint distribution of X and epsilon. Okay, so from now on, gamma is not going to appear again, okay? I'm going to just say we're going to have a parameter theta and blah, blah, blah. I just want to be clear that, you know, when you think about the model, there may be other unknowns, okay, that are floating around that we're just not directly describing. So we say that theta is identify or sometimes, you know, people say point identify relative to the model ball P if and only if capital theta naught is a singleton for all p, okay? There's a unique solution to this problem. There's a unique value of the parameter we care about that gives us that the model is equal to the observed distribution. Theta is unidentified relative to ball p if capital theta naught is just the entire parameter space for theta. So theta naught here is just capital theta for all p, and any case in between, we say that theta is partially identified. Okay. So as I said, you know, capital theta now has been characterized in many examples and can often be characterized by using moment inequalities. Not all the time. So the word often here is uh, really important because, you know, it really means two things. One is that there are certainly examples that cannot be written as moment inequalities. Okay and those exist and they may be important. Two, there are a lot of examples that can be written as moment inequalities, okay? So um, it's a large class, it's just not the entire, um, um, the entire space of things that could happen. So this is what we're gonna do today. We're gonna talk about some examples. Missing data we already covered, okay? I'm gonna, Talk about a baby version of entry games. Then we're going to briefly discuss reveal preferences. Once we have these examples, and hopefully you have a sense that inequalities come naturally in different contexts, then we're going to
talk about confidence regions for partially identified models, and we're going to discuss how uniformity here is important in ways that was different than the ones that we discussed before. And then we're going to move to say, okay, how we construct these confidence regions, okay? We're going to do that by so-called test inversion. We're going to need a test statistic and a critical value. And the gain here is not going to be so much in the choice of the test statistic as going to be in how we compute the critical value. And so then we're going to just take one of the test statistics, stick to that. We're going to see that you can uh, define critical values in roughly five ways. If you understand these five ways, you essentially understand most of the literature. It's not, again, 100% comprehensive. There are some other methods that will involve some deviation from this. But conceptually, if you understand these five uh, ways, you, uh, you can get a sense of, you know, what are the relative merits of uh, different ways to think about this problem. Today, we're going to stop here. Okay. And then all this is just going to be tomorrow. Tomorrow meaning Tuesday, next week. Okay. And that includes the problem of sub vector inference and some extensions that um, may be important. Okay. But that's, that's the plan for today. Do you have any questions about what I said so far? All right, entry games. So consider a situation where we have cross-sectional data on firms in each market, okay? The objective is to estimate the impact of competitors on firms' profits. The issue in this literature is that there is so-called multiple equilibria, as we're gonna describe in, in a model, and this is why we call the model incomplete, which means that you cannot use maximum likelihood. This was very clearly explained in Eli Tamer's uh, job market paper. So the model is actually partially identified. And one solution uh, to this is the following. One is sort of like you change what you pay attention to. Uh, for example, you just look at the number of entrants as opposed to just who enters. Okay, you just look at how many people enter. And so you change sort of like the model and then you realize that um, under certain assumptions, the number of firms in a market is unique. Um, and so, or in other situations, people will make um, uh, equilibrium selection assumptions that will say things like the firm that is the, has the largest market share in other markets is the one that enter first, or the, you know, some criteria to store firms and decide, you know, who which is the firm that will enter first. And it will be a way of choosing one of the multiple equilibrium and having unique equilibrium. And once you have unique equilibrium, all the issues that are around uh, partial identification disappear. However, that was, you know, as you can see from the dates of these papers a long time ago, and the literature moved away from this type of assumptions. And now people just want to be flexible about uh, how to deal with multiplicity. Okay. so. An alternative approach is to say, okay, I'm going to allow the model to have multiple equilibria. I'm going to account for that. And that will in turn lead to a moment, uh, a model with moment inequalities. And again, so a lot of these papers, if you go and read uh, conceptually, follow a very simple intuition, but they use, uh, they, they could be heavy in notation. So I'm going to um, illustrate this with the simplest example uh, possible. So consider this there are two firms index here by j and there are n markets indexed by n okay so remember that the idea is that we're going to have um observations uh for different markets and then the actions that this firm can take is y which is binary is enter the market or not and there's one action in every market and the payoffs are going to be given by this pi function over here which are assumed to be known, okay, by the firms. So it is epsilon, which is the benefits of entry, or you can call them uh, monopoly profits, okay? And there's a term here that uh, subtracts profits if the other firm, the competitor, enters, okay? And of course, we are normalizing the profits to zero if the firm doesn't enter. So the firm will enter whenever this profits, epsilon minus theta is 
positive if the other firm enters and you know if epsilon is positive if the other firm doesn't enter so here i'm going to normalize epsilon to zero one just to um okay again make the case very simple and uh forced to have partial identification uh in this context um but again as i said there's nothing specific that follows from this case the minute that you consider more firms um, um uh more sophisticated profit functions with, uh, say, covariates and so on, the same issues that we're going to describe here are going to hold. And theta here is just going to be what I call the first sensitivity to competition. It's going to be the parameter of interest. So I'll plot it here. We have theta a, epsilon 2, sorry, and epsilon 1, the shocks of firm 1 and firm 2, okay? And then um, in a given market, and then you have theta 1 and theta 2, which is just I place here and here. And so the idea now is to see when are we going to have equilibrium here. And notice the following. If both, if epsilon 1 is above theta 1 and epsilon 2 is above theta 2, then the only equilibria is that um, both firms enter. I mean, epsilon is high enough for both firms that they don't care if the other firm enters or not. So they decide to enter. Well, both enter. That's an equilibrium. If, you know, if epsilon 1 is above theta one, but epsilon two is below theta two, then you have a situation where firm one wants to enter, firm two, you know, would be happy to enter if firm one doesn't enter, but firm one does enter, and so one zero is the equilibria, right? And then you can see the same situation over here. And here is the issue that we see, which is um, when both epsilons are small, there's only room for one firm to be profitable. And so it could be that firm one is profitable or firm, firm two is profitable. So zero one and one and zero are both equilibria in this market. And we don't know which one happens. So this is what we call the region of multiple equilibria. Okay, in this example, as I said, it's very simple, it happens only in one of these blocks. The more sophisticated examples, they may, there may be multiple equilibria everywhere, okay? But here, it just happens in this particular block. And so the question is, what would we do with this? Well, so far, in, and in, when you talk about games, it is important to be clear about what the game is, what firms observe or not, and so on, and what do you observe as econometrician. Because from a game point of view, this is a complete information game. Firms here know everything, right? But as an econometrician, of course, we don't know the epsilons, okay? So the econometrician observes just the actions, whether firms enter or not in every market. It's a two-dimensional vector that is like 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, uh, 1, 0, and so on. Then, typically, we will need to make an assumption on these epsilons, okay? In, in most papers, you know, these epsilons are normal or whatever. Again, for the sake of this example, to make it simple, I'm going to assume it's uniform. Um, zero, 01. And then what are the parameters we care about? Well, what, what I'm calling here theta naught, which is the uh, firm one sensitivity to the entry decision of firm two and the other, the other one. And so now the goal is to use this um, picture over here to show that we can um, use or manipulate this picture to obtain moment inequalities. Let's do that. Notice the following. Without further assumptions, the probability that you observe 1, 1 is this box. That's for sure. That's the only place where you see 1, 1, okay? So the probability of observing 1, 1, given that our assumption that epsilon is uniform, well, it's just 1 minus theta 1, this, 1 minus theta 2, this. And this is an inequality, okay? Now think about 1, 0. Well, 1, 0 happens here. So the probability that we observe one zero has to be at least equal to this box. And this box is one minus theta one times theta two, okay? Which is this thing. Now, notice that one zero also appears over here, right? In the region of multiplicity. And we don't know how often one zero is gonna happen in this box. But we know that, you know, at most, it could happen all the time. So the probability of observing one zero has to be bounded by this rectangle, which is no other than theta two. 
And so by doing this, we were able to have bounds on the probability of observing one zero. We can do the same for zero one, but you don't, you know, since in this case, zero one is one minus the other two, you don't need to do it. And so we have a model with one moment equality, which is coming from here, and two moment inequalities coming from these two. One way to think about this is you can say the probability of observing one zero is equal to the probability of observing one zero conditional on being in an area of, I'm gonna call SE, this is loppy, but just conceptual condition being or uh, a unique equilibrium, UE, plus the selection of one zero or here, the probability that you are one zero condition on being an area of multiplicity, okay? And this is what we call, you know, um, you can write it as a selection times this, this box here. And then one way to think about these inequalities is that the unknown thing is the selection probability. With what probability condition on falling into an area of multiplicity, you choose one zero as the outcome. And that probability, which I could call selection, can go from zero to one. So when you set it to zero, you obtain this thing. When you move it all the way to one, you obtain the upper bound. So another way to think about the problem is to think about the parameters you know nothing about, which in this case is the selection probability in the area of multiplicity, and moving that from zero to one. Okay, which is very similar to what we did in the missing data, where the object in that case that was completely unidentified was mu zero, and what we did was to move mu zero from zero to one. Okay. Now, if you plot those moment inequalities into the space of theta one, theta two, okay, you're gonna see that the identified set in this case looks like this. One salient feature is that one. Uh, is nonlinear in this case because you know it's just about uh, follows from this uniformity assumption. But most importantly, this set doesn't have an interior because there's an in, uh, there's an equality going on. And um, when there's an equality, you know, when people talk about identified sets, they imagine things like look like this, right, with a well-defined interior. That sometimes happens, but then you can see this is a subspace of R two is a line, and so um, doesn't have an interior. I don't want to say that this means that they holds generally. This is a very stylized version of an entry game, okay? That was, as I said, a stylized version. Uh, the paper that sort of like thought about a problem like this was this paper by Ely Tamer and Federico Siliberto called Market Structure and Multiple Equilibrium in Airline Market. It's an 09 econometrical paper. And it's a complete information static entry game, okay? where airlines are the players and the market is a city pair like Chicago, New York, you know, San Francisco, LA. And so they simplified, um, the simplified version with two firms essentially looked like this. The outcomes that we defined before, markets here indexed by M, and then you have covariates, okay, and the entry decision of the other firm. Uh, in the paper, they were like, of course, there are multiple airlines, but as the number of airlines grow, the complexity of this goes up uh, by a bunch. So what they did is that they collapse, um, uh, um, sorry, airlines by categories like small carriers and big carriers and whatever. And that's how they did. And then they look at big players like American and United. And I forgot Southwest was another one they care about. But there were some groupings. They just didn't look at all the airlines individually because, again, you're going to see that computationally this problem becomes very quickly kind of almost borderline intractable. And the model implies an upper bound and a lower bound on outcome probabilities. So when you now write the condition, the probability of observing one zero condition on X, then since you will make in assumptions on the distribution of, the, of these epsilons, sometimes even if that's not an easy or tractable closed form solution, you can describe what this is 
uh, okay, at least conceptually, and you're going to have an upper bound that will depend on the joint probability of this guy's condition on X and so on, and a lower bound. And then you typically can simulate uh, these upper bounds and lower bound. What are these are exactly the same uh, from um, intuitively from the ones that we got from the example, where the lower bound is the probability that one zero is the unique outcome of the game. Okay, that was here, the unique outcome of the game. And the upper bound is the probability that one zero is one of the outcomes of the game. Okay, and this is the probability that one zero is one of the outcomes of the game. And so that's how you typically simulate. Um, and so the model, you know, here, for example, when you just go to the real application in order to obtain the moment inequality, you first needs to like simulate. Okay. In this case, we just obtain things in closed form because the uniformity assumption and the fact that we didn't have X's made this calculation straightforward. Okay. Where in reality, even though you can, you know, write the probability or the event that you need, these upper bounds cleanly, typically they don't have a tractable form, so you need to simulate them. Uh, but this was exactly done like this in this paper by Silivert and Tamer. The other very well-known example is the so-called this uh, reveal preference, okay, which is um, follows the idea that discrete choice demand models have reveal preference foundations. Okay, you see that somebody makes a decision could be a consumer making a purchase decision. A firm deciding to enter in the market, um, and um, a company deciding to sell a product in a market or not, and then all these decisions have revealed preference implications of the form that if you, if we assume that you're maximizing your utility or maximizing profits, the decision that you made led to a higher profits than doing something else, which is deviating from what you did, right? And this is the so-called revealed preference inequality that was um, um, developed and pushed by Pecos and co-authors. But um, you know, when people think about this in the context of moment inequalities, you know, very often they just follow the approach uh, developed by Pecos in, in different papers. Uh, this one in particular explains more or less the intuition of others. And this paper was published in 2015, but was around for a long, a long time. Uh, time okay so um, um so the main idea is as follows firms have profits which you're going to know by pi j of the entry decision of the firm or the decision of the firm not entry could be anything else uh the decisions of the other firms and some covariates and the behavioral assumption is this which is the supremum of the things that you can decide Suppose that this is like, I don't know, the number of products that as a firm you decide to put on a market. Okay, well, if you just take the supreme one of your profits, okay, this has to be less than or equal than the amount that you actually decided to sell, which is your strategy. If you're profit maximizing, you choose a strategy that is not dominated by any other strategy because otherwise you would have picked the other one. Okay, and that's the behavioral assumption. As you can see, this is eventually going to lead to a set of inequalities. So um, how many inequalities? Well, it depends on a few things, because as you see here, we're not going to typically compute this supremum. What you're going to do is you're going to say, OK, what is the choice set? OK, and sometimes this choice set is not big. So suppose a firm can do like one, two, three and four you observe that firm and market J decided to do two. Well, then you're going to do this inequality two versus one, two versus three, two versus four. And then you're going to have three inequalities for that, say, market and so on. Uh, but sometimes there are a lot of uh, points. For example, in this paper, this PPHI refers to the paper by Pekas Porter Juan Ishii. They analyze the number of ATMs chosen by banks, okay? And then, as you can see, ATMs could be any number from zero to some uh, large number if the city is big. And so, in that case, just considering all possible deviations from 
what you decide in a market. Suppose that, you know, you look at a Bank of America and CDA, and then they have 23 ATMs, then you are not going to do 23 versus 22 versus 24 versus 25 versus and so on, because it's just going to be a lot. So typically people do like plus minus one, plus minus two, say plus minus three, from your observed choice, okay? They just consider local deviations and those are the inequalities that you obtain from your model, okay? This is a popular approach that is full of issues that I'm not gonna describe today because it doesn't require to uh, typically, uh, computationally, even though you don't see it here because you, you know, in order to appreciate that, you probably have to read this paper, okay? Computationally, in many settings, it's a lot easier to implement than the full model approach as in Silver and Tamer. But these are the two contrast, contrasting ways to think about the problem. Are you just model? What's the probability of observing an outcome from a model? You talk about multiple equilibria or just ignore about that and you just come and, and use exploit this rebuild preference thing. There are other discussions that I'm not gonna discuss as well that have to do with the assumptions on the model. The previous case, essentially assumes that, you know, players are uh, playing Nash Equilibria, right? Because we derive things as a Nash Equilibria. Here, you're not assuming that. You're just saying that firms maximize profits, okay? And so it's, it's, it's a weaker requirement. Um, and so it's less subject, if you want, to misspecification or the like. But, you know, they all have their own issues, their pros and cons, and depending on who you talk to, what they're gonna um, say, okay? But for now, I just want you to be uh, clear that um, there are essentially different ways where you are gonna end up with a model, with a model that looks like moment inequalities. And from now on, I just want to say, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take the moment inequalities as given. I wanna make sure that you understand where these are coming from. Questions. Good. So as I said, then um, we're going to now take the moment inequalities as given, and we're going to start thinking about what to do with them. Okay. So what we want to do is confidence regions for theta, inference broadly defined. Of course, you know you might want to test theta is equal to three, but we're going to think about we just want a confidence region for theta. So if theta is identified relative to p, ball p. Okay, so this is the point identify case. Then think about what we want from a confidence set. So we say, well, we require that the limit of the infimum over P of the probability that the confidence set includes theta, contains theta, is at least equals to the uh, coverage level we want, one minus alpha generically. So now we have the issue that this set may not be, um, that this parameter, sorry, may not be identify or point identify. So we need to make sure that this coverage holds for any point that in the identify set, okay? And then if we have a confidence region that satisfies this property, we said these are confidence regions for points in the identify set that are uniformly consistent in levels. Yes, and then once you're good, you can say that entire sentence without breathing. The remark is that you may also be interested in confidence regions for the identify set itself. And that will require or amount to having something like this, okay? And so when you care about the entire set, okay, then, you know, there are papers that work this out. And when you care about points in the identify set, there are papers that work this out. The literature eventually mostly focuses on this for reasons that we can describe later, but this also got um, important attention early on. Um, this case typically is more complicated than the other one. But, um, and then if you think conceptually, this is, this is the two ways that I typically uh, tell my students to think about the distinction between these two. Go to the case where we had missing data, and so theta was the expected value of x. Okay? Suppose that you care about the mean income in a population. You really care about what's the mean income. And now somebody tells you like, well, 
your data comes from a survey and some people did not respond. So you have a lot of missing data. And then you say, okay, um, partially identify. So um, I'm gonna account for this, uh, but the object that I care about is still the same object, which is this one, right? So why would I change the object now to this one, right? That's one way to think about, and you know, and that may or may not make sense, but it's a way to think about and justify why you would care about something like this. However, this also has another way to think about, which is, well, in the point identify case, actually this guy is just theta p, is, is a singleton, right? So the in the point identify case, they're the same object. And if you talk to somebody like Chuck, I remember, you know, we had conversations about this a while ago, which is, he would say, look, you typically do inference on objects that are identified, okay? It's like, it's just that you take it for granted, but you know, typically you first decide what's identified and then you do inference on things that are identified. And in this context, the thing, the object that is identified is the identified set. It's not a point in the identified set. Fine. So overall, I don't have a view on this, okay? Of course I have a view, but I'm just saying is it's not that you, you can um, say with straight face, oh, uh, this makes sense and this doesn't make sense or the other way around. There are two ways to think about the problem. In reality, I wanna say, this is typically harder to implement. Plus, you can show that this confidence region is always, is never smaller than this one, okay, by construction. So this one is always larger. And in this literature, since people typically have things that are already too large, you know, having some extra, let's call it power, is welcome. And so as a result of like being computationally simpler and, you know, being able to uh, deliver smaller conference region, people say, I like this, <laughs> okay? Just because of that. And there's a lot more work on this than in this case, but not because it's more or less important. It's just because of how it works. And this problem, as I said, was easier to analyze, easier to exploit, easier to make improvements upon. So that's why uh, uh, we learn about this. So we're gonna focus on this today. But as I just said, you know, there may be th situations where you care about this. So how are we gonna construct these confidence regions? We're gonna use duality. Cn can be constructed by inverting tests for each of the individual hypotheses that theta it belongs to the identified set. This hypothesis over here, notice that now we index the hypothesis by theta because we're just gonna be testing so many hypotheses in reality or like that is just saying theta belongs to the identified set. An alternative way to write this, which you will often see is to write H theta is that the expected value of some moment that depends on theta, okay? I'm gonna introduce the notation is less than or equal to zero in a minute. So saying this or saying this is gonna be equivalent, okay? But more specifically, suppose that for each theta, okay, uh, in the null hypothesis, we have a test that is available. I'm gonna denote this test by phi n, okay? As I always do. And this test satisfies this property. Limb soup of the soup of the soup of the rejection probability is less than or equal to alpha. So as you can see, relative to this uniformity stuff that we were talking before, uh, now we have this supremum uh, that is new. This one is the one that we learned that we want if you want to have good approximation to a finite sample problem. And it's the same that, that we've been discussing up until now in this third part of the, or second part of the class. But this part is new and you two have been partially identified. So the result that is kind of straightforward says that if you have a test that has this property and you define your confidence regions as all the value of theta that are not rejected by this test, then this confidence region is gonna satisfy the properties that you want. So I want to change the problem. That's the thing. We started off with the idea that we want to construct these confidence regions. And what I want to say is that at the end of the day, I'm not going to bother trying to think about how to form the confidence region. I'm going to try to find this test. Because if I find this test, then I can construct the confidence region like this with the properties that I want. 
so so that you don't get lost. So what are we going to do? We're going to try to find a test that has this property. Now, if you look at this and you are somebody who, you know, is thinking about doing computational work and so on, you will notice that this um, is um, this um, requires a, a computational, uh, computationally not trivial problem, right? Which is you need to be able to test this hypothesis for any value of theta in the parameter space. So if theta is scalar, for example, you can imagine doing some sort of like grid search and then you just get it, test it, and collect all the ones that are not rejected. Theta is two-dimensional, then you can imagine doing something like this as well. Now, if theta has dimension 10, and I'm not going crazy, I'm just saying 10, this problem becomes actually complicated. And so is an issue. So the computational aspects of this literature are still an issue moving forward. But just so you understand, Leaving aside the computational feasibility, this construction requires you to explore the parameter space, capital theta. All right. So the confidence region I just described requires this property, uniform consistency in levels. Of course, you know, we know by now that you could have said, you know, Forget about this in Femans here, they're like complicated. Let's just ask that the limit probability that your confidence region covers theta is greater than or equal to one minus alpha for all P and theta in the identified set. Right? This is an alternative way of writing a coverage probability that, as you know, looks quite reasonable, but we know that this requirement here is point wise, point wise in P, most importantly. Okay, and so when we have something like this, it's possible that for all n, there is a distribution in our ball p and a theta such that the coverage probability is 1 minus alpha. And I wrote here in well-behaved problems, the distinction is entirely a technical issue. This is something we discuss, right? If you think about regression or testing the mean, it's just, okay, yeah, you cannot test this in large bold P, just assume two plus delta moment, problem solved, okay? In less well-behaved problems, like the ones that we're describing here, the distinction is gonna be more important, okay? <coughs> and by that, I mean that even after we assume conditions like uniform integrability or two plus delta moment, decisions are gonna still be here, okay? And what the implications of this is what I wrote here, that some natural confidence regions may need to restrict P in ways that are unpleasant, okay? So, and in particular, one common thing that you may need to uh, assume in order to say what I'm calling here natural constructions is to assume that your model is far from being identified, which is, as I said, is, is an unpleasant assumption because you're in a situation where there's partial identification, you want to do inference that works well, and now you want to do the use this, you know, confidence sets that you know from other courses, and those will only work well if your model is really partially identified. But if your model is just lightly partially identified, meaning that the size of the identified set is small in some sense, then these methods are going to perform quite poorly. So I want to illustrate that with an example. And this is actually the simplest example that you can construct from my point of view. And it applies immediately, for example, to the case of uh, missing data, though um, uh, this is going to be even one step uh, farther into the simplicity. So let W be of a very uh, random variable, L and U. And L will be for lower bound and upper bound in a way. And we're going to assume that the model is a normal distribution with two means, mu l and mu u, and this restriction. We know that mu u is strictly larger than mu l. Sigma here is gonna be known, okay? I don't know what it is, but we're gonna assume that we have unit variances so that we don't care about standardizing things. 
okay? This is quite simple. Now suppose that there's a parameter theta, and theta is known to belong to the identify set, which is given by the lower bound and the upper bound of these mu's, okay? So you have a model that tells you that this is the case, right? That's all I'm saying. You may say, where is this coming from? Where are you getting this? Well, think about uh, the model with missing data. That's exactly what we had in a way, okay? Just that we have more notation. I want to make it simpler. But missing data gave us an upper bound, a lower bound on theta of two things that were like means. Okay, so consider this case. Now, how will you do this when you see me, oops, mu l and mu u? I said, well, this is one of the natural constructions. You say, well, I observe a, a random variable l and a random variable u. I know that I could use l bar and u bar to estimate these things. And these are normal in this case because these are like normal random variables. So let me use the usual normal quantile and the normal quanta. This is what I call a, nat a natural construction. Just look at the upper bound, the lower bound, realize that both are normal here. Just use the quantile, one minus alpha quantile. And then you just, um, you know, build this confidence region like this. Why is this uh, natural in a way? Well, part of the reason why this is natural is because this approach, this confidence region over here, it is actually point-wise consistent in levels, okay? Let's see this. Let me write. So for um, any P, and theta, the probability that theta belongs to this confidence set is equal to the probability that theta is in between L bar minus the quantile divided by square root n and u bar n plus the quantile divided by square root n. This is equal, if you just think about it for a second, to z1 minus alpha plus square root n mu upper p minus theta minus the CDF of a normal negative C one minus alpha minus square root n theta minus theta L P. And so This is going to be equal. Let me split this in two to this I'm going to say here if theta equals to mu L P and it's going to be equal to this. If theta is equal to the upper bound. where in each of these situations, B is uh, um, let me write it in some other color here. In each of these situations, B is mu U minus mu L. So now this then converges as n goes to infinity to 
1 minus alpha, okay, if theta is equal to mu LP converges to 1, if theta is strictly below mu L and mu U, and is again 1 minus alpha, if theta is equal to mu U. And we can see that this is always then greater than or equal than one minus alpha. So this construction that I'm saying is quote unquote natural, well, is point wise consistent in levels. You just I didn't take I take any p, any theta, doesn't matter, any theta in this range that we're considering, and then we have that the coverage here is either one minus alpha or it's just one. Now, the problem, as you can imagine, is that this CN is not uniformly consistent in levels. In fact, you can show that the infimum over P uh, and theta of this coverage probability is one minus two alpha, okay, which is strictly less than one minus alpha. So for example, if alpha is 5%, you want a 95% confidence region, then here you get a 90% 90 um, confidence region, okay? So I'm going to say, let, um, this is not working well. So let's see. Okay, let H, and I'm going to consider now my also local parameter, be the difference between the upper bound and the lower bound. And so now the probability, using the expression that we had before, probability theta, belongs to CN is the CDF of a normal C1 minus alpha plus square root N mu U PN minus theta. Okay, and then minus um negative z, one minus alpha, minus square root n, theta, minus mu l, p. This, I just copied the same expression that we had in the previous slide. This is p, n, okay? Now, I'm gonna say here, take, Theta equal to the upper bound. Then this is this because now this thing over here is zero, and with this choice of theta, this thing over here is h. Okay, now this is equal to one minus two alpha at h equal to zero. So you can, you know, consider sequences where h gets smaller and smaller and you eventually get arbitrarily close to one minus two alpha. And that's it. Notice that this holds even if we assume something like the infimum of P in ball P of mu U P minus mu L P, let's say that's some delta lower bar, if we assume that something like that is positive. So even if you assume that the infimum over all this space is such that these two means are never equal, okay? This still is not enough because, you know, 
the sample size that we will need for the approximation to be good, okay, will depend at the end of the day on the value of this thing. And as this thing becomes smaller and smaller, doesn't matter if it's positive, okay, then you will need a larger and larger sample size for this approximation to be good. And so then you just see then that um, this um, construction is not going to give you what you want. And in this case, you know, it's just giving you, say, um, alpha percent less. So if you want to do a 10% confidence region, you're going to, 90% uh, confidence region, sorry, you're going to cover 80% of the time. And so this is a problem because the difference between these two are what determine whether the model is point identified or partially identified, right? Because remember that here we said that theta is in between these two. And so if mu L equals mu U, then this equals theta. That would be point identified. You squish it. You squish the set for theta. Theta is a point where point identified. And this analysis is telling you, well, your confidence region works well, provided that these two mu's are far apart. Because when they get close to each other, which is the trick that we did over here, right? Then you undercover. And so that's problematic. And this has nothing to do with moments and so on. It's a feature of partially identified models. So is that intuition clear? So hopefully we know by now that uniformity is something to be concerned about here. It's meaningful and we need to be careful about. So let's start with the general construction. Moment inequalities. We're going to assume that we have data. Now I'm going to call the data W, okay? Um, and then it's just going to be ID from a distribution P. And then we know now that we're going to consider or focus on the cases where the identified set can be described as this. It's just a set of theta such that the expected value of some function of the data and the parameters is less than or equal to zero. The actual expression for M here will depend on the setting. And, you know, we show some examples and then, you know, the, the actual example will tell you what M is. We don't care. We just say this is given. This is our starting point. Then the goal is to do confidence regions for points identify set that are uniformly consistent in levels. And what we're going to ask is the following condition that for now should not be surprising to you now that we are imposing this, okay? What we're assuming is that the supremum over P and uniformly over theta, we have a uniform integrability condition. This is exactly the one that we wrote when we saved the t-test, okay? And all the test statistics that we are going to be using today are going to be wall-type test statistics, okay? And then... Some papers use this condition. Some other papers uh, use two plus delta moments, depending on what version of the CLT and law of large numbers. But as I say here, this is sort of like a mild condition to ensure CLTs and law of large numbers. And we saw that already. So it shouldn't be surprising that we're um, assuming this. However, you know, just to clarify, this condition is not going to solve the uniformity problems. We're going to still have the, uh, the uniformity problems coming from this intuition that I explained earlier. So what is a moment inequality test? We're going to construct a test for the null hypothesis that theta belongs to the identified set. Or in other words, that theta is such that the expected value of this moment is less than or equal to zero. And what we want is that our test controls a uniform asymptotic uh, size, okay, like this, where we have the limb soup of the soup of the soup of the rejection probability. Given such tests, we do test inversion, we get the confidence set. And what we're going to do today and next week is to consider five different tests of this form, and they're all going to take this form, and they're all going to be different here. difference of these guys are going to be on the critical value. The test statistics, you know, we're going to keep it the same. I mean, of course, you, there are different choices, but, you know, this is like, uh, despite being a stretch, 
is like when you talk about non-parametric regression, you talk about kernels and bandwidth, and you always say like, well, the kernel doesn't really matter much. Uh, what matters is the choice of bandwidth. Well, here is roughly the same. The, the choice of test statistic is not going to make a huge difference. The choice of critical value will make a huge difference. So this is the notation slide. And I know that it's sort of like, um, sort of like a lot of notation to get started, but I really need you to remember all this by heart now. Um, so we're going to be using the empirical measure p hat, that shouldn't be hard. Mu theta p is just going to be the mean, you know, these moments that we have, it's just they depend on theta and p. Uh, M bar is going to be the sample element as sample analogs of uh, mu. So it's just going to be the sample average of these moments M. That should be clear. Omega hat is going to be the sample correlation. So this is a correlation matrix. So matrix has one in the diagonals and correlations of the diagonals. Okay. And we're going to be using this omega business. Then we're going to have the variance of each of these moments, sigma square J, theta P. And J here index each of these moment functions. We're going to have potentially many. Then we're going to have this sample analog of that, which are going to be sigma hat square J. And then I would say that up, up until now, you should remember all these objects because the notation is quite standard. The one that deviates perhaps from standard notation and that we're going to use is this D. D is a diagonal matrix, okay? So D hat N. Theta is a matrix that um, essentially looks like this, as um, sigma hat one, sigma hat and two, dot dot dot, sigma hat and k. Sorry, this hat not square. And then zeros. So these are st standard errors, okay? And the good thing is like, this is the trick that we're going to use. D hat N inverse, okay, times this M bar is going to standardize. It's just going to be means divided by standard deviations, means divided by standard deviations, but in a matrix notation type of way or vector if you want. So you're going to see this object appear quite often. So you say like, where is D hat inverse coming from? We're standardizing so that things are scale invariant. So we want to standardize that. Okay. This is a notation. If you don't, if you forget, if it becomes unclear um, what I'm doing, just stop me and ask me the notation as we move along. So test statistic. What is going to be a test statistic? A test statistic is going to be a function of two things. I want you to pay attention that there's a comma here. Okay. Comma. So it's going to be a function of d hat inverse a square root n bar. This is a usual t testing, a square root n x bar divided by sigma. Okay. And is also a function separately, possibly of the correlations of the moments, which is this omega hat. So we're going to consider test statistics that admit this representation. So I'm going to be using T and theta everywhere, and I'm going to be exploring some properties of this test statistic. So all the results that I'm going to present hold for any test statistic that takes this form. What are examples? The examples are the so-called modified method moments, which is just you know the sum across all the moments of the maximum between this and zero. Remember that our model says that the expected value of mj is less than or equal to zero. So if you know you obtain an M bar N that is really negative, then you know that's not a problem. Okay? Because it's consistent with your model. You that 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 shouldn't be counted as a as a as a positive distance from what you're saying. So and then you're not taking that. So if this is really negative, you're just gonna take zero. However, the minute that this starts being positive, this dominates and then you take you know, the positive part. And then you take the square, you know, as usual. This is like sum of squares, except that we are only penalizing in one direction. Then you have the max test statistic, which instead of like taking a sum of all the moments, 
you just take the maximum of all the moments and then you see if that is above zero or not. This one over here has some other advantages, in particular in models with many moment inequalities. We're gonna see, okay? Um, and this one over here, the first one was initially one of the most uh, popular ones. And then a third one, which is an example that uses these co correlations, because as you can see, the first two examples don't use the information in Omega hat at all, okay? Um, is what is called the adjusted quasi likelihood ratio statistic, which if you ignore this tilde here, just say that is Omega hat, then you have a quadratic form that looks like a wall type statistic, but again, where you just penalize in only one direction. And so then you introduce this T over here and you take the infimum of all the T's that are negative or less than or equal to zero, sorry. So this is a wall type that only penalizes in one direction and it's called a quasi likelihood ratio statistic. The only difference is that here, omega tilde is uh, a matrix that is a function of the omega hat that you know could be singular in many cases um, if uh, two moments um, collapse that aren't linear and it happens. And so um, you just, uh, to make it simple, you always like lift it up a little bit if that's the case, which is what you're doing over here. So this test statistic, which is related to the empirical likelihood test of this problem, um, is known to have better power properties than the other two, but is often significantly more complicated to compute. And as I said earlier, since computational tractability is gonna be a primordial concern here, people you know, eventually said, you know what? I like the fact that you could gain power with that, but these two alternatives are a lot simpler to compute and computational time is very important. So in practice, Actually, I'm gonna say, I don't recall any actual apply paper that uses this test statistic. Okay. And it's a sensible decision given the time constraints and computational constraints. So that's the test statistic. So as I said, I'm not gonna go through these examples because everything that we're gonna prove is gonna hold for the generic version. So it holds for any choice. And there are others, I'm not presenting all of them, okay? but. Uh, so that you get a sense of what this is about. The critical value is the tricky part, okay? And the critical value, we're gonna do it by defining an auxiliary distribution, which is this J business over here. I know that you just stare at it, you go like, what is this, okay? But this is actually very useful. And um, this is a device that we develop in this paper to make sure that we could explain all the different approach in a comprehensive framework, okay? So even though this is a paper that tries to sort of like aggregate the literature, I view this as an important contribution because it really um, allows you to think about all these problems in a unified manner, okay? Which is something that um, wasn't straightforward to do. But this I'm gonna call an auxiliary uh, distribution. What is an auxiliary distribution? It's a distribution of something that, you know, I pull off of my hat if you want, you're right? Because you say, where is this coming from? You're gonna see later, but I'm gonna define it. This is a distribution JN of X, S, theta, and P. And what is S? Well, S is just gonna appear over here, okay? Other than this, you have ZN, which is square root n, n bar minus mi, mu. This is the object that will be normal, mean zero, send some variance, okay? So that's why we have C and theta, okay? And then notice that this is not scaled by sigma, so we're scaling this by sigma by multiplying by this matrix D. And then we have the same matrix D multiplying this S business that we don't know what it is. Then the other part is the omega that we had before. And then I wanna say, we care about understanding this distribution. If we understand this distribution for a choice of S and we're smart about S, then we can do inference. What's the advantage of this auxiliary distribution? I wrote here, this distribution is easy to for a given function 
S. If you give me S, notice like this is just easy to um, simulate, right? Because like you're going to know that this guy is normal zero sigma. You can simulate normal zero sigmas. You know this D, you know this D, you know S. And say, so, well, you know the omegas as well. You can simulate the distribution by approximation, by Monte Carlo integration or whatever other method. So, for example, I wrote here, you can do non-parametric bootstrap where you just compute J of X, S, theta, and P hat, okay? So you just bootstrap data, bootstrap data, and then you replace this. Or you can use an asymptotic approximation that I call here P tilde, where you just take into account that Zn is normal, zero, sigma hat, okay? And then you just simulate from this distribution over and over and over and over. These two approaches you're going to see later are used in this literature a lot, okay? But they're using ways that do not make them, you know, again, easy to compare uh, across different uh, methods. In this notation, things are going to uh, fit nicely together. What's difficult to estimate? What's difficult to estimate is this distribution, where you replace S by square root n, sorry, square root n mu theta p. This is particular choice of s. Well, notice that when s equals that, you obtain the distribution of your test statistic. Okay? So this is the object that we want, ideally. This is what we want. But we know that this is difficult. Okay? And I'm telling you here, well, if you just give up with this idea of a square root mu, which we don't know, we cannot consistently estimate square root mu, then uh, we can just replace with some other function s that we know. And that object will be easy to estimate. The question is, what is a good choice of s. But I want to make sure now, if you agree with me, that if I know s, then we can simulate this. Do you see that? Because if you don't see that, it's going to be difficult to move forward. So just look at the slide and tell me that you understand. If you know s, if I tell you, I'm going to give you one s theta is equal to zero for all, if you know that, um, you know, that this, you know how to simulate this. I'm saying this is difficult because this is square root times a mean, right? So how do you estimate consistently square root times the unknown mean? What would be your estimator? Where a natural estimator would be a square root times the sample mean. But then the difference between the square root the sample mean and the square root your mean doesn't converge to zero, converge to the absolute value of a normal. Because you're not trying to estimate mu, you want to estimate square root times mu. And that is the object that is difficult to estimate. Again, if I ask you and you don't think about it, how you estimate that, you're, you know, surely you're gonna tell me this. And I'm telling you, that's a bad estimator because it's not consistent. It just has a lot of noise, converges to a normal distribution. Okay? So the tests that we're going to describe, okay, are five different tests to distinguish and try to circumvent this problem. And the trick that we're going to exploit is that this T, the test statistic, is weakly increasing in each component of the first argument. That's the trick. We're going to impose that as an assumption. We're going to say T is weakly increasing in the first argument. And then all the examples that I showed you earlier satisfy this. And there are many other examples that satisfy this. So then we're just going to use. But then the property that we're going to use is this monotonicity. And with this monotonicity, we're going to get around this problem. So what's the, are there any questions I should say? What is this um, first approach? The first approach is the easiest one to understand, hopefully. Well, look at this. The model says that mu is less than or equal to zero. 
then a square root n times mu is also less than or equal to zero, right? You just, mu is less than or equal to zero, you multiply by square root n, square root n times mu is less than or equal to zero. So by the monotonicity of the test statistic, this quantile, which is the quantile that we want because it has a square root n mu, is bounded by the same quantile at zero. Do you see that? Here we have square root n mu, here we have zero. So I said earlier, S theta being equal to zero, okay, and this could be a vector depending on how many the dimension of M, but you just put zero everywhere and that's a valid upper bound. So choosing this critical value, which is an estimator of the auxiliary distribution with S being equal to zero, leads to a valid test, okay? Because the quantile is at least as big as the one that we want. And I wrote here, zero is the least favorable value of the nuisance parameter square root mu. It means that you have all these moment inequalities and you assume that all of them are binding. That is the worst case that it could happen. Too many things happen at the same time. The critical value is the largest one possible and you can show that that is uh, valid. And this has been, you know, described in paper by Adam Rosen, Anderson Guggenberger, and goes back to papers by Wallach and Kudo, or, um, you know, about other types of inequalities. But the idea is that just by the monotonicity of the test statistic, which the monotonicity of the test statistic is the one that gives you this inequality, okay, monotonicity of T B, then you show that zero is a valid upper bound, okay? And this is the simplest method to do inference in moment inequality. Just assume that all inequalities are binding and pretend that you have equality. Okay, it's the simplest one. The problem with this is that, well, let me just present the result. Least favorable test then, I hear least favorable, whoa. Least favorable, it's just the test that rejects whenever the test statistic that you pick is greater than this critical value, which is the quantile of the auxiliary distribution where you set S equal to zero. And it doesn't matter if you do it by the bootstrap or by the asymptotic approximation that I described below. Both work, okay? These tests are uniformly consistent in levels, okay? So they have the properties that we want. And then if you just go back to the simple example, okay, the, the, the one that we have the lower bound and the upper bound, this test would be equivalent to using this critical value. instead of this one. So remember that we got this result that we say, oh, like the worst case give you one minus two alpha. It's like saying, well, then do a test with, you know, some alpha prime that is alpha divided by two. And then it's gonna be, well, one minus alpha. And that's what this is doing. It's just saying, I cannot do it with alpha. Let's just set alpha equal to alpha divided by two. So you want to do a 10% confidence, sorry, a 90% confidence region, just use a 5% critical value, right? This is what this test is doing. Instead of, you know, it's, it's just do it, in the, it, does it in the background, right? But then what is it doing? It's assuming that these two means are zero. The test says like, that's the worst that it could happen. Let's just pretend that that's the case. The problem is that this thing is just going to be, you can see that it's going to be much wider, right? So typically say this is 1.63, this is 1.96. So one is going to be a lot wider than the other one. And if you're not in this case, then it's going to be unnecessarily wide. But it's simple. It's a simple correction. So, remark. This test is deemed conservative 
by criticism, I wrote here is not entirely fair. In Gaussian setting, these tests are alpha or the admissible, which is not something I'm going to describe here, but uh, we discussed some of that in the paper. Some are even maximum optimal, and then there are some results about that. We presented some actually in the paper, okay? So nevertheless, I said these are unattractive. Okay, why? Because they tend to have the best power again alternatives where all moments are violated. And now imagine a situation you have 10 moments, okay? And think about alternatives where you violate one of them, but the other ones are all good, okay? You're violating moment number 10, but moments one through nine are actually less than or equal to zero. Then that's an alternative, and these tests are gonna have just terrible power against those alternatives, okay? And so that's why a lot of people will not like this test because they're gonna say, well, the alternative where all moments are violated are not the ones that I really care about. I just care when you know some may be violated and this test happens to have really bad power for those, okay? So this led the literature to say, you know what? Replacing mu, square root n mu by zero is just bad. I mean, it works, but it just has so poor power that we want to have some information about the square root n mu. We cannot estimate it consistently. We know that. Um, we would like to have some information about a square root n mu. And the first method that gives you some information about square root n mu is subsampling, okay? Which is exactly the same subsampling approach that I described before. I'm gonna cover subsampling. I'm gonna go a couple of minutes over the class, but then we're gonna be done. So, idea subsampling. Fix B, a block size, B goes to infinity, B over N goes to zero. You're subsampling experts by now. We're gonna compute the test statistic on each of the subsamples of the data, and then we're gonna define the subsampling CDF, which is just one over N, N is here all the subsamples that you take, and the indicator that this is less than or equal than X, okay? As we know, LN is an estimate of the distribution TN uh, over here, okay? And then the critical value will then be just get the one minus alpha quantile of the subsampling distribution. This leads to a valid test. It was shown by Roman Sheik, Anderson Guggenberger. So notice how the way that we do subsampling doesn't use this uh, auxiliary distribution that I introduced before at all. This is just plain vanilla subsampling. Get the subsamples, compute the test statistic again, okay? And then do it over and over and over and over and over and compute the CDF uh, in, in that process and then get the quantile of that. No use of the auxiliary distribution. You see that? They already look like something coming out of nowhere in a way, right? But what we show is that this actually fits and you can see why this works by using these auxiliary distributions that I introduced. Now the test, subsampling test is reject whenever the test statistic is greater than the subsampling critical value. That's it. So know that LN is a good estimator of this distribution, okay? Where importantly, remember we have square root B here and square root B over here. So I'm gonna denote this by a B here and B square root B times mu. That's what subsampling does. Subsampling gives us a good estimator of JB, remember? It doesn't give us a good estimate of JN. We then have to argue that JN and JB are close to each other, okay? So what we want is JN. And notice that there are two differences here, not only JN and JB, but inside, mu is being multiplied by square root n here, and mu is being multiplied by square root b here. So the question is, why is this a good approximation to this? And we're gonna answer this question using this auxiliary distribution. Well, notice the following. It's easy to link jb to jn and account for these two things, okay? First, we know that jn and jb get close to each other for the same value of s and in particular, uniformly over S, okay? So this is sort of like what subsampling gives us. Second, know that the square root n mu is less than or equal than the square root 
B n. Why? Because we know that B is less than or equal than n. And mu is less than or equal to zero. And so a square root B mu is a valid upper bound of square root n mu. This is a valid upper bound. So the quantile that we want, which is this one, we can obtain, but this is the quantile that we can approximate. This is the subsampling quantile, more or less, approximately, where we use this inequality. So the subsampling critical value is a valid upper bound of the critical value that we want. This is where the inequality comes from. And of course, the actual proof is in Romano and Shake. But the idea now is that we didn't do zero. The idea now is that if there's a moment, say mu j, whoops, mu j that is really negative, I don't know, we're not gonna be using zero, we're gonna be using square root b times this thing. And this is gonna be very negative. And so now we're gonna be using it, we're having information about the moments Subsampling is going to be giving more information to those moments or that are close to zero than those that appear to be far from zero. Again, we are not estimating square root n mu, but we can bound square root n mu by this inequality at the top. And all we need is upper bounds. All we need is that our critical values are at least as big as possible. Okay, that are at least not smaller than the true critical value. Of course, you know, I repeat, we ideally we want this guy because this is exactly the critical value that we need. But if we can get a critical value that is not smaller, then we are good. The least favorable one gave us one that was bigger, but it was too big sometimes. So this, you can show that it's gonna be smaller than the one from the least favorable one, but it's still gonna be bigger than the one that you want. The main problem with subsampling is not this. The main problem with subsampling, as always, is the choice of B, okay? Where you go to implement it, and then you choose different Bs, and then you get different numbers. And that's why, you know, uh, people sometimes dislike it. But if you go back to the paper by C. Liberton Tamer that I uh, described before, there just did subsampling in that paper, right? At the time, there wasn't much else to do, and it was clear that that was better than just using the least favorable one. Uh, but on a computational note, now you need to compute subsampling over and over for each value of theta, right? This is everything that we're doing is for a given value of theta. And then remember that at some point we said that we need to explore the space. To conclude, these are some of the references that I uh, mentioned today, directly or indirectly. And as much as this was intense, perhaps this is the end of today's class.